Um, Hebrews chapter 2, and we read verses 9 through 13 last time, but we didn't get beyond verse 10 in our comments. Let's pick up again at verse 11. It says there, Hebrews 2, verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. That is, they're from one source, and that is God. One who sanctifies, or sanctify means to set something apart for a specific purpose, a specific use. And the one who sanctifies is Christ, and the ones who are sanctified are us. And he says, for which cause he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them, us, brethren. So because he was a man, he is our older brother, as it were. Go, if you will, back to the book of Matthew, chapter 12. Matthew, chapter 12. And Matthew 12, we'll begin there at verse 46. It says, While he had talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So, in that sense, Christ is likened to an older brother, yet, uh, in a sense, he is also our father. Because down in verse 13, it says, Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. But it goes even beyond that. Uh, for in another sense, we are said to be his wife. We are the husband's bride, as it were. Go back to the book of Ephesians and chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and let's begin there with verse 27. It says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Christ is the head of a body that makes up the bride, that makes up his bride collectively. All Christians who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of language, regardless of gender, regardless of, and there, and there are only two genders, by the way, regardless of that, regardless of, of um, history and nationality, um, height, weight, so forth, uh, anyone who is a true believer of Je in Jesus Christ, and regardless of whatever denomination they might be sitting in at the moment, if they are a true believer in the Lord Jesus, they have trusted him to be their savior by a simple act of faith. Amen. Uh, they are part of the body of Jesus Christ. And all Christians throughout the world collectively constitute the bride of Jesus Christ. That is the true church. That's what we call the universal church of Jesus Christ. And he is the head of that body of believers uh, who is his bride. He is also the older brother of any believer uh, who makes up his body. Christ is the the generator of a seed which is said to be his or who are said to be his sons psalm 22 
verse 30 states, A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. So his brother, a husband, and a father, in, a, in different senses, to the Christian. Um, go, if you will, back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Just to confirm the point I just made. John chapter 1. And notice there verses 12 and 13. The Apostle John says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so in that sense, Christ is also, not only is he our older brother, not only is he our bridegroom, but he is also, in a sense, our father. Mm -hmm. um, Israel was also given three relationships to God in the Old Testament. First of all, Israel is called God's firstborn son. And I mean the, the collective nation of Israel, not simply Jacob uh, himself, whose name was changed to Israel. But the nation of the Jews was said to be God's firstborn son. Exodus 4, verse 22. Uh, Israel, secondly, is also called God's wife, or likened to a wife in Hosea, chapters 1 through 4. An unfaithful wife, too, by the way. Hosea was told to go marry a whore, a harlot, um, and have children by her, and so forth. And then watch what she does. She uh, left him to sneak off. Uh, to be with other men because she was in the habit of doing so and God's trying to illustrate to the prophet Hosea this is how the nation of Israel has treated me I mean that's a dramatic way to learn an object lesson <laughs> and yet that's what God did that's how God uh, reinforced and emphasized the point he wanted to make to the prophet Hosea and then thirdly Israel is likened to an individual man um, I'll have you go back to the book of Hosea just to uh, indicate this point. Hosea and uh, chapter 12, right after the book of Daniel. I'll give you a few moments to find it. Hosea chapter 12. And notice the language of verse 2. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways. And by, excuse me, according to his doings will he recompense him. And also Hosea 14, just over a page, Hosea 14, and uh, verse 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. The word thy uh, is applied to an individual when God speaks. If he was referring to a collective group, he would say you or ye. Uh, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. So the nation of Israel, uh, sometimes referred to as, as Judah, sometimes referred to as Jacob, uh, all of those terms are interchanged with each other numerous times throughout the Old Testament. Uh, he refers to the nation of Israel as an individual man. So Israel had three relationships with God identified in the scriptures. Now back to our text in Hebrews 1, and verses 12, or rather Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2, verses 12 and 13, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, there is that brother element again, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Uh, the word church in verse 12 uh, is a, another reference to the, to the um, nation of Israel. Uh, you don't need to turn, but let me turn over there for you. That's back in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. 
This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So the nation of Israel was a, a, a called out assembly. They were called out from among, Abraham was called out from the, from the nations around him. God says, I'm going to start a new line of descent with you and upon your seed I'm going to pour out, uh, pour out my blessings. And um, so they, he was separated from the Chaldeans and the world of wickedness in which he lived. And then the nation, his descendants, Israel, were called out of the land of Egypt to serve God, and he would lead them to a land he had reserved for them alone. And uh, the quotations there in verses 12 and 13 are from Psalm 22, verse 22, and Isaiah 8, verses 17 and 18. And true to form, the modern and the newer and up-to-date translations have made their helpful changes to our Bible. Um, the revised version, 1885, replaced the word captain, verse 10, with the word author. The NIV, 1978, the new ASV, about 1964, they each did the same. The Revised Standard Version, 1952, reduced the captain down to a pioneer of salvation. And the Living Bible says the captain was merely a leader of salvation. Uh, the JW Bible, the New World Translation, calls the captain a prince of salvation. And uh, another contemporary version called the Message written by a man named Eugene Peterson, 1995. Uh, it's a paraphrase, much as the Living Bible was. He calls Christ the salvation pioneer. Peterson, Peterson also says that in verse 10, Christ put himself into the family circle. Verse 10 says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. But Peterson says God put Christ into the family circle. And I have no idea what he might mean by this. Is he referring to the comic strip? Or is that called the family circus? I think it's called the family circus. Or maybe he's referring to some old... Um, Hillbilly's song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. Uh, I have no idea what Eugene Peterson meant by that, but that's okay. Neither did he. Um, listen to the language of verse 10 once again in the authorized text. For it became him, Christ, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, compare that. I'll compare that with the crude, um, coarse language of Mr. Peterson's book here called The Message. The Message. Let's see. And of course, like so many other Paraphrases. At least the Living Bible, I think, had uh, verse numberings. This one doesn't even have any verse numberings. You have to kind of hunt through it to figure out which chapter you're in. And he writes about there, about, uh, well, verse 10. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. What kind of language is that? He really helped, didn't he? He really helped. Um, back in the intro, I was reading this this morning, wasting time this morning reading this stuff, and it says, Introduction to the New Testament. The arrival of Jesus signaled the beginning of a new era. God entered history in a personal way, 
and made it unmistakably clear that he is on our side, doing everything possible to save us. It was all presented and worked out in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It was and is hard to believe, seemingly too good to be true. Who talks like that? Who talks like that? Um, this version of the New Testament in a contemporary idiom keeps the language of the message current and fresh and understandable in the same language in which we do our shopping, talk with our friends, worry about world affairs, and teach our children their table manners. You know, Kenneth Taylor's Living Bible, he said much the same thing. He said, uh, rather than when he was reading the Bible to his children gathered around the table, uh, he wanted it to read in a language that they could understand. So he wrote his paraphrase called the Living Bible. And in the Living Bible, uh, Saul calls his son Jonathan S-O-B. And he didn't abbreviate it the way I just did. And when Elijah's contending with the prophets of Baal, 1 Kings, uh, or 2 Kings 18, uh, he says, go ahead and cry out loud. Uh, maybe your God is out busy. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's busy sitting on the toilet. That's why he can't hear you. Is that what you teach your children? Are those the table manners you teach your children? And uh, God struck Kenneth Taylor down. He lost most of his speaking voice because he had tampered with the words of God, and I believe he tampered with Mr. Taylor's speech as well. But uh, the, rather than contemporary translations, I think they should be called contemptible translations. <laughs> I think that would be more accurate. Um, also, look over at Hebrews chapter 12. Just a few pages forward. Hebrews chapter 12. Here's another good example. And Hebrews 12, verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That language is graceful, and it's the its purpose is to tell you how much benefit a good spanking from your father will do you in the long run. It'll change your way of thinking. How many of you remember that old song about the attitude adjustment? So-and-so needs an attitude. That means you need a good beating. It'll straighten you out. You need a good correction by your father. And if your father's not around or able to do it, then your mother needs to slap you around a little bit. You know, <laughs> straighten, straighten a few things out. But um, listen to what Mr. Peterson says. Let's read his rendering of that verse. And I thought uh, Hebrews... 12 verse 10, that's going to be one of the most elegant texts in the entire English language. And the whole meaning of that verse is how much good a spanking will do a kid that's disobedient. The peaceable fruit of righteousness it yieldeth, and so forth. Beautiful, elegant words. Hebrews 10, and uh, where is it at here? Oh. All right, Hebrews 12, excuse me, you're right. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 and verse 11, you're, you're right. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in the relationship with God. That's got to be some of the most pathetic English writing of the last four centuries. It really is. There's nothing worse than, than that except maybe the J.W. Bible. The J.W. Bible's got to be some of the worst English uh, prose ever put on paper. Let me read to you something. Peter Hitchens is one I mentioned last week in my sermon on uh, when God, when a bad man gets saved, and he's the younger brother of the late atheist Christopher Hitchens. 
And uh, he writes about his, he, the title of his book is called The Rage Against God, How Atheism Led Me to Faith. And he had been raised as a young child in the Church of England, but it, it wasn't long. He and his brother both rejected any religious influence that they might have had as children. But Peter Hitchens writes about his, his conviction about his own sin and the possible truth that there might be an eternal judgment of fire waiting for him if he died without Jesus Christ. And um, I don't pretend to understand how somebody today would find any spiritual substance in the Church of England. But then again, that was the Church of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. That was the Church of George Friedrich Handel. That was the Church of Johann Sebastian Bach. That was the Church of John Charles Wesley and their training before they truly committed themselves to Jesus Christ. It came under conviction. And so, who am I to say what goes to the mind of a, of a Briton, an Englishman, as opposed to the very casual way we are free to worship here in the United States? But um, Peter Hitchens became a, has become a real uh, believer in the power and the importance of the King James Bible. And he laments the fact that the the uh, Church of England abandoned it. Um, I think around 19, here's a chart of uh, several English translations starting with 1881 all the way down to the message, 1995, by Mr. Peterson. And I don't know how many I wrote in here, uh, maybe 15, 20, 20 perhaps, but there were about a hundred translations from 1900 to the year 2000. This is just a few of them. Every single one of them claiming to update the English, make it more readable than the previous, uh, you know, 35, 40 versions. And I think 1970, the New English Bible, I think that's the translation the Church of England um, adopted and rejected the King James Bible. But Peter Hitchens writes about his conversion back to the Lord Jesus, or back to, uh, to Jesus Christ, and re-entering the Church of England. And his once girlfriend, now wife, who was also, he says, um, who was also an unbeliever and an atheist, also took a different route and came to the same conclusion, that they needed the Lord Jesus Christ. They needed God's forgiveness. And he writes, the swearing of great oaths concentrates the mind. So did the baptisms first of my daughter and then of my wife, who, raised as a Marxist atheist, trod another rather different path to the same place. Her christening, that's what they called that, followed a particularly lovely and robust form devised in 17th century England. I remember the rather reasonable answer the candidate is asked to give in reply to the enormous question, Wilt thou then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments, and walk in the same all the days of thy life? The required response is, I will endeavor so to do, God helping, God being my helper. Which seems to me to be a realistic promise. And then he says, My own confirmation by contrast, was a miserable modern language affair with all the poetic form of a driving test and endured by me in much the same spirit. That's very well put. As I said in my sermon last week, he's an excellent um, public speaker and a very excellent writer. But in 2012, Mr. Peterson, a retired Presbyterian minister, he's 84 years old, and he's with this Regent College up in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's written about 30 books on religion and theology and commentary on various parts of the scriptures. But in 2017, Mr. Peterson expressed his support for same-sex marriage and was asked, if he would perform a same-sex 
wedding? And he said, yes. And he said, uh, he stated, I wouldn't have said this 20 years ago, but now I know a lot of people who are gay and lesbian, and they seem to have as good a spiritual life as I do. He says, I think that kind of debate about lesbians and gays might be over. It's not over, my friend. As long as one of us is still fighting, it's not over, right? The gays are still fighting it. Weren't they given the, the, the freedom to marry like everybody else just a few years back? And yet they're still clamoring they're not being treated equal. They're still, you still see them slapping their rainbow flag and the equality bumper stickers on their cars. And you still see them um, uh, vocal and adamant that uh, they need more rights, they need more privileges. They want the right to teach children. In fact, they're teaching children in California public schools, elementary level, that uh, <clears throat> families are made up of two men just or two women, sometimes a man and a woman, uh, sometimes only one parent and uh, children, and uncles and aunts and pets and so forth. Those make up families. And... Um, they're being taught uh, birth control methods in kindergarten and first grade. And they're being taught about the rights of gays and homos and perverts and queers and sodomites. And uh, right now, the state of California legislature is considering a bill, or they've approved a bill. And we'll see if uh, Governor Ferry Jerry Brown uh, signs it into law. How many noticed that slip? See what I did there? Okay. Back in the 70s, Jerry Brown wasn't married yet. He was in his 40s just dating a rock star, Linda Ronstadt, and everybody figured he was a queer. He may have, might have been. But, um, but they're considering a bill in the California legislature now which would prohibit anyone, anyone from counseling a homosexual out of his homosexuality into a normal life of a man and woman. Someone who doesn't want to be attracted to the same sex. He knows it's wrong or she knows it's wrong and everything in their, in their instinct and their mind and thoughts knows it's not right. And my parents wouldn't be proud of me and yet I, I, kept, I keep yielding these temptations and I don't know what to do about it. And uh, it's a sneaky way of getting Christians, uh, making it illegal for Christians to counsel somebody using the Bible as their guide. And so if this is passes, and any literature that might counsel someone away from the homosexual life will then be deemed illegal in California, and that would include the scriptures. Leave it to a democratic socialist to try to outlaw the scriptures. Um, evil has a new name, it's called the Democrat Party. You say, well, you shouldn't say that on the Internet. Why not? The whole world needs to know. The Democratic Party of the United States, and particularly the state of California, is pure evil. They have no knowledge of God. They don't want anything to do with God. <clears throat> except to make fun of him, to mock him, yeah. and to restrict the rights of those who, of us who still love him and, and thank him for everything we have. But Mr. Peterson uh, had to backtrack his words when uh, Christians who had been reading his stuff and buying his books uh, protested his opinion about gay marriage. He tried to backtrack, well, uh, I was caught off guard in that interview, and he asked me a question I wasn't prepared to answer. And uh, you can't say, yes, I would marry a same-sex couple, and then backtrack and say, well, I hope I never get asked to, because I don't want to do it. Just, if they ask you, say, no, I don't believe in your filth. Right. Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else, get your wedding cake baked. Go somewhere else and get your flowers or your balloons or your clown costume, whatever you're going to get married in. Go somewhere else and do those things, but don't come to me. He says, I still have a biblical view. He doesn't know the Bible, the Bible's view of marriage at all. Didn't we read that passage earlier in Ephesians 5? Um, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The relationship between uh, Jesus Christ uh, or Jesus Christ. And his bride, the church, is the model for a husband and a wife. Amen. You couldn't insult the decency and the dignity of God any worse than to say that two men or two women constitutes a marriage. You're, in, you're insulting the model that Jesus Christ or Amen. God the Father gave to us. 
It might be filth, but it's not a family. Two men who's, forgive me for being blunt and plain and crude and crass, but two men whose, whose main common interest is a mutual love of sodomy is not the basis of a family. Amen. 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 They're perverts. And Mr. Peterson's an unsaved man. What can I conclude by that? This guy doesn't know the Lord Jesus. He can write books. Yeah. You know, the, there's an old expression, those that can, do. Those that can't, teach, or they get jobs as professors in universities. They have no real uh, experience. He wouldn't know how to lead a soul to Christ because he's never met Jesus Christ. A lot of people have made careers in religion, yeah. but don't know the Savior. Amen. A lot of people. And um, he writes this book, The Message, the idea that you're going to put it in plain language, the same kind of ordinary, common, everyday street language we all use to teach her. He didn't write that to make the Word of God plainer. You mean to tell me all of these guys and all of their efforts didn't make the Word of God any plainer? It, we, need it, we need Mr. Peterson, 1995, to do it for us? None of these people, who all claim to be doing the same thing, by the way, yeah. every version be, claims to be improving the ones that came before it, making it more up-to-date. The English language doesn't go out of date every three years. He did it to make money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Now that, actually, let me read one thing out of his message. How many, how many ever heard the joke is by the British comedy group, Monty Python's Flying Circus. The, the, the joke goes like this, and now a message from the Swedish Prime Minister. How many heard that joke? And all you hear is this. Sounds like a massage, you know, but the way the announcers are now a massage by the Swedish Prime Minister. You're waiting for a message and it's nothing but, you know, somebody being patted down. But this is what Mr. Peterson writes in Hebrews chapter 2. About man. Back there in the... Back there in verse 7, our text says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Mr. Peterson writes, What is man and woman that you bother with them? Why take a second look their way? You made them not quite as high as angels. And then it says about Jesus Christ there in verse 9, What we do see is Jesus made, quote, not quite as high as angels. Now, it might, it might be very subtle, but rather than the focus being on the humility of Jesus Christ and the humility of man, he switches the focus to the exalted, the elevated level of angels. We're not quite as high as angels. Christ was not quite as high as the angels when he came into the world. That's why I say Mr. Peterson doesn't know Jesus Christ, never been introduced to him. He's probably one of these guys that think angels have wings on their back. Angels don't have wings on their backs in the scriptures. You won't find a single verse in either testament that describes angels with wings on their back. That came out of the Middle Ages and Middle Age uh, artwork where they started depicting with angels and confusing them with the uh, cherubim mentioned in the book of uh, the books of Ezekiel and Daniel and other places, book of Revelation, uh, who are described with angels on, uh, with with wings, wings rather, and that out came from someone confusing angels with cherubim, which are two separate classes of beings, and so they started drawing wings on their backs and depicting them in artwork that way, and uh, that went from both. Young, all angels in the Bible are described as young men. There are no angels described as young women. There are no angels described as little chubby cherubs with a diaper and a bow and arrow, right? Like Valentine's Day. None of those are in the scriptures. And yet, so all this mythology, all this folklore has crept in to common Christian understanding that has no basis in scripture at all. All you have to do is read it. I like what Brother Lee gave us a good testimony in church last week about 
uh, dealing with somebody at the mall, and they were telling us what that telling him what that verse means is this, or it means that. And he said to them something I have said repeatedly: I don't want to know what the Bible means. I don't know what the I don't want to know what the Bible teaches. The first thing I want to know is what does the Bible say? Amen. And then the rest, the, the right teaching and the, and the uh, message will come after that. But what does the Bible say? And then what, is it doesn't, what does it not say? And you learn a lot just making that simple comparison. 